the third second word. This word consists of three stopping places. It is an addendum explaining the eighth flush of the twenty second word and is also a commentary on the first of the fifty five tones with which all the beings in the universe testify to divine unity. These tongues have been alluded to in my treatise called Katre, a droplet. It is one truth which has been clothed in the garments of comparison of many truths pertaining to the verse. Had there been in heaven or on earth any deities other than God, there surely would have been confusion in both. First, stopping place. In the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate. Had there been in heaven or on earth any deities other than God, there surely would have been confusion in both. There is no God but God. He is one. He has no partner. His is the dominion and His is the praise. He grants life and deals death and is living and dies not. All good is in His hand. He is powerful over all things and with Him all things have their end. One night in Ramadan, I said that the above sentence affirming divine unity consists of 11 phrases and that in each of them is a decree expressing that unity and some good news. But of those degrees I only discussed the meaning and significance of he has no partner and that was in the manner of an allegorical conversation, an imaginary debate that would be accessible to ordinary people. I am now writing down that conversation at the request and desire of my much valued brothers who assist me and my friends from the mask. It is as follows. Let us suppose one person represents all those things set up as partners to God that all the different varieties of idolaters imagine to exist. These idolaters are the people of unbelief and misguidance who worship nature and causes, for example, and assign partners to God. The fictitious person wants to have mastery over one of the beings in the universe and so claims to be its true owner. Firstly, that maker of false claims encountered a particle which is the smallest of those beings and he spoke to it in the language of naturalism and philosophy saying that he was to be its master and true owner. But the particle replied to him with a tone of truth and dominical wisdom, saying, I perform innumerable duties. Entering many creatures, which are all different, I do my work in them. And there are, from among countless particles like me, those that move from place to place and work with me. Not. Indeed, every object which is in motion from minute particles to the planets displays on itself the stamp of eternal besottedness and unity. Also, by reason of its movements, each of them takes possession of all the places in which it travels in the name of unity, thus including them in the property of its owner. As for those creatures that are not in motion, they are each of them from plants to the fixed stars, like a seal of unity showing the place in which it is created to be the missile of its maker. That is to say, all flowers and fruits are stems and seals of unity which demonstrate, in the name of unity, that their habitats and native places are the missiles of their maker. In short, through their motion all things take possession of all things in the name of unity. That is, one who does not have all the stars within his grasp cannot have mastery over a single particle. If you have the knowledge and power to employ me in all those duties and the authority and ability to employ and have at your command all those others as well, and if you are able to be the true owner of and to have total control over the beings of which I become a part in complete order, for example, over red blood corpuscles, then you can claim to be a master over me and ascribe me to something other than God Almighty. But if you cannot do all these things, be silent. And in the same way that you cannot have mastery over me, you cannot interfere in any way. For there is such complete orderliness in our duties and motion that one who does not have infinite wisdom and all-encompassing knowledge cannot meddle with us. 
If he did, it would cause chaos. However, a person like you, who is thick, important, and unseen, and is in the clutches of blind chance and nature, could not even begin to stretch out a finger to interfere. So, just like the materialists, the one making these claims said, in that case, own yourself. Why do you say you are working on someone else's account? To which the particle replied, If I had a brain like the sun, and all embracing knowledge like its light, and all encompassing power like its heat, and comprehensive senses like the seven colors in its light, and if I had a face that looked to all the places in which I travel, and all the banks in which I work, and an eye that looked to them, and words that carried authority with them, then perhaps I would indulge in foolishness like you and claim to own myself. Get out. Go away. You won't get anything out of me. So, when the representative of those things held to be God's partners the spirit of the particle, he helped to pursue the matter with a red blood corpuscle. And coming across one he said to it on behalf of causes and in the language of nature and philosophy. I am your master and owner. And the red corpuscle replied to him through the tongue of truth and divine wisdom. I am not alone. If you are able to own all my fellows in the armor of blood whose stamp nature as officials and order is the same, and if you have subtle wisdom and mighty power enough to own all the cells of the body in which we travel and are employed with perfect wisdom, and if you can demonstrate this to be the case, then perhaps some meaning might be found in your claim. But someone's to fight like yourself cannot be owner with your own sport, being deep nature and blind force. Indeed, you are unable to interfere in so much as an atom. For the order with which we function is so perfect that only one who sees, hears, knows, and thus everything can have authority over us. And saying, so be silent. My duty is so important and the order so perfect that I have no time to answer garbled rubbish such as yours. It repelled him. Then, since he was unable to mislead it, the representative left and next came across the little house known as a cell of the body. He said to it in the language of philosophy and nature. I could not persuade the particle and red corpuscle, but perhaps you will be reasonable. Since you have been made of several substances, just like a minute house, I am able to make you. You will be my artifact and true property. The cell responded to him through the tongue of wisdom and truth, saying, I am only a minute little thing, but I have very important duties and very sensitive relations. I am connected to the body as a whole as well as to all its cells. For example, I perform complex and faultless duties in the veins and in regard to the arteries, the sensory and motor nerves, the powers of attraction and repulsion and procreation and the imaginative faculty. If you have the knowledge and power to form, arrange and employ the whole body and all its blood vessels, nerves, and faculties, and if you have comprehensive wisdom and penetrating power with which to control all the body's cells, which are like me, as regards qualities and artistry we are brothers, demonstrate it. Only then can you claim to be able to make me. If you cannot, then off with you. The red corpuscles being my food, while the white ones combat illnesses which attack me. I have work to do, do not distract me. Anyway, an impotent, lifeless, deep and blind thing like you cannot in any way interfere with us. For we have such an exact, subtle and faultless order that if the one who has authority over us was not absolutely wise, absolutely powerful and absolutely knowing, our order would be broken and our regularity spoiled. Not. The all-wise maker has created the human body as though it was a well-arranged city. A number of the blood vessels, 
perform the duties of telephones and telegraphs, while others of them are like pipes, from a fountain to a rich blood, which is the water of life, flows. As far blood created within it are two sorts of corpuscles. One of them, known as red corpuscles, distributes nutrients to the cells of the body, it conveys sustenance to the cells according to a divine law, like merchants and food officials. The other sort are white corpuscles, which are fewer in number than the former. Their duty, like soldiers, is defense against enemies such as illness. Whenever they undertake that defense, with their two revolutions, like Mevlevi dervishes, they take on a swift and wonderful state. As for blood, as a whole, it has two general duties. The first is to repair damage done to the body's cells, and the second is to collect and waste matter from the cells and to clean the body. There are two sorts of blood vessels, veins and arteries. One of these carry perfect blood, they are the channels through which clean blood is conveyed. The others are the channels for the turbid blood which collects the waste matter This convey the blood to where breathing occurs, that is, the lungs. The old wise maker created in the air two elements, nitrogen and oxygen. As for the oxygen, when it comes into contact with the blood in breathing, it draws to itself, like amber, the impure element, carbon, which is polluting the blood. The two combine and are transformed into matter called carbonic acid gas. Oxygen also maintains the body temperature and purifies the blood. This is because, in the science of chemistry, the all wise maker bestowed on oxygen and carbon an intense relationship which might be described as chemical passion, whereby, according to this divine law, when those two elements come close to each other, they combine. It has been established by science that heat is produced by combining because it is a sort of combustion. The wisdom in this is as follows. The motion of the particles of those two elements is different. On combining, the particles of one element unite with those of the other, each two particles thereafter moving with a single motion. One motion remains suspended because before combining there were two motions, now two particles have become one. Each pair of particles has acquired a motion like a single particle. The other motion is transformed into heat according to a law of the all wise maker. As a matter of effect, motion produces heat is an established principle. Thus, in consequence of this fact, by this chemical combination, as carbon is removed from the blood, the body temperature of human beings is maintained and at the same time the blood is purified. On inhaling, oxygen both cleanses the body's water of life and kindles the fire of life. On exhaling, it yields in the mouth the fruit of words which are miracles of divine power. Glory be unto him at whose art the mind is bewildered. Then. The one making the claims despaired of it too. He encountered the body of a human being and said to it, once again as the naturalists say, in the language of blind nature and aimless philosophy, You are mine, it is I who made you, or anyway I have a share in you. The human body answered with the tongue of reality and wisdom and through the eloquence of its order. If you possess the power and knowledge to have actual control over the bodies of all human beings who are the same as me and on whose faces are the stamp of power and seal of creation which are the same and if you have the wealth and jurisdiction to own from water and air to plants and animals the treasuries of my sustenance and if you have infinite power and boundless wisdom with which to employ me with perfect wisdom and cause me to perform my worship and the power and wisdom to launch in a narrow, lowly vessel like me in material and subtle faculties like the spirit, heart and intellect which are extremely vast and exalted and for which I am merely the sheath, then demonstrate all this and afterwards say that you made me. Otherwise, be silent. Moreover, 
According to the testimony of the perfect order in my body and the indication of the stamp of unity on my face, my Maker is one who is powerful over all things, knows all things, and sees and hears all things. Someone aimless and impotent like you cannot meddle in his art. You cannot interfere in so much as an atom. The representative of the things imagined to be God's partners could find no way in which to interfere in the body, so he went off. Next, he encountered the human race and said to himself, This is a disorganized and unruly group. Perhaps, like a Satan interferes in their individual and social actions, which they perform through the exercise of their wills, I will be able to find some way to interfere in the functioning of their bodies and natures. And then, finding some way, I will be able to exercise control over the body and the body's cell which sends me pecking. So, he said to the human race, once again in the language of deep nature and aimless philosophy, You seem to be, to be in great confusion. I am your master and owner, or at least I partly own you. To which the human race answered through the tongue of truth and reality, wisdom and order. If you possess the power and wisdom to make the shirt that gloves the whole globe of the earth and is woven and sewn with perfect wisdom from the multicolored threads of all the hundreds of thousands of animals and plant species of which we are one and to make the carpet which is spread over the face of the earth and is woven from the hundreds of thousands of species of animate beings and is created in an extremely fine and ornamented fashion and to continuously renew and refurbish it and if you possess comprehensive power and all embracing wisdom with which to have free disposal over the globe of the earth of which we are the fruit and over the universe of which we are the seed and to send us our vital necessities from all the regions of the cosmos with the balance of wisdom and if you have the ability to create all those like us who have gone before us and those who will come after us on whose faces the stamp of power is the same then perhaps you can claim to have mastery over me but if you cannot be silent do not say that seeing confusion in my species you will be able to interfere in some way because the order is faultless the conditions you imagine to be confused and disorderly are transcribed with perfect order according to the book of power and divine determining for the perfect order in animals and plants which are far inferior to us and are under our supervision demonstrates that the seeming disorder in us is but a sort of writing. Is it at all possible that the one who artistically positions one thread running through a whole carpet should be other than the master designer of the carpet? Or that the one who creates a fruit should be other than the creature of the tree that bore it? Or that the one who creates the seed should be other than the fashioner of the being that produced the seed. Also, your eyes are blind. You do not see the miracles of power on my face, the wonders of creation in my being. If you did see them, you would understand that my Maker is such that nothing at all can withstand Him or be difficult for Him. The stars are as easy for Him as particles. He creates the spring with as much ease as a flower. He is one who includes the index of the vast universe in my being with perfect order. Could a lifeless, impotent, blind and deep thing like you interfere in any way in the art of such a being? So be silent. And saying, off with you, go away, he drove him away. Next. The one making these claims went and addressed the broad carpet covering the face of the earth and the lavishly decorated and embroidered shirt clothing it on behalf of causes and in the language of nature and philosophy, claiming, I can have control over you and be your owner or at least have a share in you. So the shirt, the carpet, said to him on behalf of truth and reality, and through the tongue of wisdom. Not. In fact, the carpet is both living 
and vibrates in a regular fashion. Its embroideries are being continuously replaced with perfect wisdom and order in order to display the ever differing manifestations of the weaver's names. If you have the power and art to weave and create all the well-ordered and purposeful shirts and caps whose embroideries are all different, which have clothed the earth to the number of years and centuries, then have been removed in an orderly fashion and strung on the line of past time and will clothe the earth again, carpets and shirts whose programs and forms have been drawn and specified in the sphere of divine determining and which will be attached to the ribbon of future time and if you have two wise and powerful hands with which to reach from the creation of the world to its destruction, indeed, from pre-eternity to post-eternity, and if you have the wisdom and ability to create every one of all my threads, and to repair and renew them with perfect order and wisdom, and if you are able to hold in your hand and create the globe, which is our model and is wearing us, making us its veil and outer garments, then you can claim to have mastery over me. If you cannot, then away with you. There is no place for you here. Moreover, there is on us such a stamp of unity and seal of oneness that one who does not have the whole universe within the grasp of his power and who cannot see at one time all things with all their functions and cannot do innumerable things at the same time, who is not all present and all seeing everywhere, who is not unconfined by space and who does not possess infinite wisdom, knowledge, and power, such a one cannot own us, neither could he in a fair. So the representative went off, saying, Perhaps I will be able to persuade the globe of the earth and find something going for me there. So he went and said to the globe, once again on behalf of causes and in the language of nature, Since you travel in such an aimless manner, you demonstrate that you have no owner in which case you can be mine. Not. In short, the particle referred the claimer to the red corpuscle. The red corpuscle referred him to the cell, and the cell referred him to the human body, the human body to the human race, and the human race to the earth's shirt, which is woven from all the species of animate creatures. The earth's shirt referred him to the globe of the earth, which in turn referred him to the sun and the sun referred him to all the stars. Each one of them said, Go away, if you are able to take possession of the next one up from me, do so, then come and try to be my master. If you are unable to defeat it, then you are unable to get possession of me. That is to say, one whose authority does not extend to all the stars cannot make a single particle heed his claim to mastery. To which the earth replied in a thunderous voice, in the name of truth and with the tongue of reality. Do not talk such utter nonsense. How could I be just aimless and without an owner? Have you found my garments or even the tiniest points or thread in them to be in disarray, without order, and have you seen them to be without wisdom, purpose, and art, that you tell me I am ownerless and aimless? If you can really own my vast orbit round, which I travel in one year, a distance that should take approximately 25,000 years, where I perform my duty of service with perfect balance and wisdom, and own the ten planets, which are my brothers and are charged with duties like myself, together with the space through which they travel, and if you have infinite wisdom and power with which to create and position the sun, which is our leader and to which we are bound and attached by a compassionate attraction and to fasten me and the other planets to eat like stones in a sling and to employ us and cause us to revolve with perfect order and wisdom, then you can claim to have mastery over me. But if you cannot, get out. Go to hell. I have got the work to do, my duty to perform. Not. If half the diameter of a circle is approximately 180 million kilometers, 
the circle covers approximately a 25,000 year distance. Moreover, our magnificent order of some movements and purposeful subjugation demonstrate that our master is such that all beings from minute particles to the stars and galaxies are obedient and subjugated to him like soldiers under orders. He is an all-wise possessor of glory, a possessor of absolute sovereignty, who arrays the sun with planets as easy as he arrays and ornaments a tree with its fruit. Since the claimer could find nothing for himself on the earth, he went off and said to himself about the sun. This a huge great thing. Perhaps I will be able to find a home in it and open up a way in, then maybe I will be able to subjugate it as well as the earth. So he said to the sun as the fire worshippers speak in the name of idolatry and in the language of the philosophy that is the mouthpiece of the devil. You are a ruler, you own yourself, you dispose of matters freely as you wish. But the sun replied to him in the name of truth and through the tongue of reality and divine wisdom saying, God forbid, a hundred thousand times God forbid. I am a subservient official. I am a candelabrum in my lord's guest house. I am not the true owner of a fly or even of a fly's wing. For in the fly's wing there are immaterial jewels and antique works of art like eyes and ears such as are not in my shop. They are outside the sphere of my power, thus reprimanding him. So the one making the claims changed his approach and said with the tongue of devilish philosophy, Since you do not own yourself, you are a servant, I claim you on behalf of causes. To which the son replied, speaking for truth and reality and with the tongue of worship, I can only belong to one who is able to create all the lofted stars which are my fellows, to place them in the heavens with faultless wisdom make them revolve with utter magnificence and to adorn them with exquisite finery. Next, the claimer said to himself, the stars are a great multitude and they seem to be all scattered and in disorder. Perhaps I will be able to gain something out of them on behalf of my clients. So he went in among them and said to them on behalf of causes and those things ascribed to God as partners in the language of rebellious philosophy and as the Sabian star worshippers said, Since you are so scattered, you are all under the jurisdiction of different rulers. To which one star replied, speaking for all the others, Just how stunned, brainless, stupid and blind you are not to see and understand the stamp of unity and seal of oneness on us and not to recognize our lofty order and regularity and the laws of our worship. You imagine us to be without order, but we are the words of art and servants of a single and unique one who holds in the grasp of his power the heavens which are our seas, the cosmos which is our tree, and infinite space which is where we make our excursions. We are electric illuminations and resplendent witnesses displaying the perfection of his dominicality. We are radiant proofs proclaiming the sovereignty of his dominicality. With all our different sorts, we are luminous servants in the domain of his sovereignty which give light and display the majesty of that sovereignty in the lofty dwellings and in the lowly ones, in the dwellings of this world, the intermediate world and the hereafter. Indeed, each of us is a miracle of the single and unique one's power, a well-ordered fruit of the tree of creation, an illuminated proof of unity, each of us is a dwelling place, aeroplane and mask for the angels, and a lamp and sun for the lofty worlds, and a witness to the sovereignty of the multiplicity, and each of us is an ornament, palace and flower of space, and a shining fish in the heavenly seas, and a beautiful eye in the face of the sky. Not. This means we are indications observing and contemplating the wonders of God Almighty's creation and causing others to contemplate them. That is, 
just as the humans are seen to be observing the wonders of divine art on the earth with countless eyes, so, like the angels in the skies, the stars watch the earth, which is an exhibition of wonders and marvels, and they cause conscious creatures to observe it with attention. Furthermore, throughout us as a whole there is a silence within tranquility, a motion within wisdom, an adornment within majesty, a beauty of creation within order, and a perfection of art within symmetry. And although we are thus and proclaim our glorious maker and his unity, oneness, eternal besottedness, and his attributes of beauty, glory, and perfection to the whole universe with innumerable tongues, you still accuse us utterly pure, clean, obedient, and subservient servants of being confused, disorderly, and without duties, and even of being without an owner. You therefore deserve a truly punishing slap. And once the tar, like the stone hurled at Satan, delivered such a mighty slap at the claimer's face that it flung him from the stars to the very pit of hell. And it cast nature, which was together with him, into the values of delusion and chance into the chasm of non-existence, and those things ascribed to God as partners into the darkness of impossibility and the philosophy that is hostile to religion down to the lowest of the law. Not, but after its fall, nature repented. It understood that its true duty was not to act and to have an effect, but to accept and be passive. And it recognized that it was a sort of notebook of divine determining, but a notebook capable of change and transformation that it was a sort of program of dominical power was similar to the body of the rules of creation laid down by the all-powerful one of glory and was a collection of his laws. It assumed its duty of worship with perfect submission acknowledging its utter impotence and thus acquired the title of divine creation and dominical art. All the stars recited this sacred decree together with that star. Had there been in heaven or earth any deities other than God, there surely would have been confusion in both. And they proclaimed, there is nothing from a fly's wing to the lambs in the heavens, nothing, even the size of a fly's wing, in which those things ascribed to God as partners could interfere. Glory be unto you, we have no knowledge self that which you have taught us, indeed, you are all-knowing, all-wise. O God, grant blessings and peace to our Master Muhammad, the lamp of your unity in the multiplicity of your creatures, and the herald of your oneness in the exhibition of your creation, and to all his family and companions. In the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate, look, then, to the signs of God's mercy, how he restores to life the earth after its death. The following section alludes to one flower from the pre-eternal garden of the above verse. It is as if all the blossoming trees are beautifully composed oaths speaking poetically through the tone of disposition reciting the manifest praises of the glorious creature. Or it is as if all the blossoming trees have opened thousands of gazing eyes and have caused thousands of others to open in order to behold, not with one or two eyes, but with thousands, the glorious fashioners, wonders of art, which are being broadcast and exhibited, and so that attentive people will gaze on them too. Or it is as if all the blossoming trees have beatified their verdant limbs with the finest adornments for the moments of their parade and for their own particular festivals in the general festival of spring, so that their glorious monarch will contemplate the gifts, subtle wonders, and resplendent works of art he has bestowed upon them, and so that he will present the creation's gaze the bejeweled instances of his mercy in springtime and on the face of the earth, which is the exhibition of divine art, and so that he will proclaim to mankind the wisdom in the creation of the tree. He demonstrates the perfection of divine power through showing that important treasure hangs on their delicate branches and what significant wealth 
that is in the fruits of his merciful bounties. The imagination sees heavenly angels embodied from these trees with thousands of flutes. From these flutes, the consciousness hears the praises of the ever-living one. Their leaves have tongues, each reciting the words, It is he, it is he, meaning, O oh, ever-living one, O oh, ever-living one. Since all things chant in unison, there is no God but he. And they are seeking truth, from beginning to end they recite, O oh, ever-living one. They are chanting in unison, O oh, God. And we send down from the skies water rich in blessings. A short addendum to the first stopping place. Listen to the words. Do they not look at the sky above them? How we have made it and adorned it, and there are no flaws in it. Then look at the face of the heavens. You see how it is silent in its tranquility, how it is in motion with wisdom, how it is radiant with majesty, how it smiles with its adornment. An unending and infinite sovereignty is proclaimed to those who think by the order in its creation, by the symmetry in its art, by its shining lamps, its brilliant lanterns, its glittering stars. Do they not look at the sky above them? How we have made it and adorned it, and there are no flaws in it. The following explains the above passage. Then look at the face of the heavens, etc., which in turn is an explanation of the verse quoted. Firstly, the phrase, how it is silent in its tranquility. The verse directs an attentive gaze to the beautifully adorned face of the heavens, so that the one beholding it may become aware of the silence, that which is within a vast tranquility, and so that he may understand that it is thus through the command and subjugation of one possessing absolute power. For if they had been independent and unrestrained, those huge gloves, all in close proximity to each other, those infinite, awesome even the bodies, would have caused such an uproar with their enormously swift revolutions that they would have deafened the cosmos. And there would have been such confusion in that tumultuous commotion that it would have scattered the universe. It is well known what a commotion and uproar it causes if twenty water buffalo work on top of each other. Whereas we know that there are among the stars some which are thousands of times larger than the earth and which revolve at a speed seventy times faster than that of a cannonball. So the degree of power and subjugation of the glorious maker an all-powerful one of perfection may be understood from this together with the degree of obedience and submission to him of the stars. Secondly, the phrase, how it is in motion with wisdom. The verse commands us to look at the motion on the face of the heavens, which is with wisdom and purpose. Indeed, that mighty, wondrous motion occurs within a precise and comprehensive wisdom. For example, a craftsman who operates a factory's machinery with wisdom and purpose demonstrates the degree of his skill and craftsmanship in proportion to the order and grandeur of the factory. Similarly, when we look at it in this way, the degree of power and wisdom of the all-powerful one of glory become apparent to us through his making the mighty sun as a factory and its planets those awesome immense globes like the factory's machinery and his spinning and revolving them like stones in a sling. Thirdly, how it is radiant with majesty, how it smiles with its adornment. It has this meaning. The radiant majesty and smiling adornments on the face of the heavens are such that they demonstrate the sublimity of the glorious maker's sovereignty and exquisiteness of his artistry. As the myriad electric lamps hung about on festival days demonstrate the degree of king's majesty and achievement in material progress, the vast heavens, too, with their majestic and adorned stars, demonstrate to attentive gazes the sublime sovereignty and exquisite artistry of the glorious maker. Fourthly, 
by the order in its creation, by the symmetry in its art. This phrase says the following. Look at the order of the creatures on the face of the heavens and see their symmetry and precise balance. Then understand just how powerful and wise is their maker. Indeed, the vast heavens demonstrate the degree of power and wisdom of the one who transforms various and tiny creatures or animals, thus preparing them for their duties and who impels each of them on a determined way by means of its particular balance and the degree of their obedience and subjugation to him. Similarly, the vast heavens demonstrate to attentive gazes through their awesome vastness and innumerable stars, and the stars, through their imposing hugeness and speedy revolutions, and the fact that they do not exceed their bonds by an order even for a second, or neglect their duties for a tenth of a second, the exceedingly fine and particular balance with which the glorious maker carries out his dominicality. Fifthly, an unending and infinite sovereignty is proclaimed to those who think by its shining lamps, its brilliant lanterns, its glittering stars. This phrase states clearly what is alluded to in the above verse, and in many similar to it, which mention the subjugation of the sun, moon, and stars. That is to say, to attach the heat and light-giving lamp of the sun to the embellished ceiling of the skies, and to make it the ink pot for writing the missives of the eternally besought one in lines of day and night on the pages of summer and winter, and to make the moon like the our hands which shines on the large clocks on minarets and towers, and our hand of time's mighty clock on the dome of the heavens, and to make it move through its mansions with precise balance and perfect measure in the form of many varying crescents, so that it leaves one crescent one night and then later returns to collect it and to adorn the beautiful face of the sky with stars that twinkle and smile in the dome of the heavens. All these are signs of the unlimited sovereignty of a sustaining dominicality. They are indications of a majestic divinity which makes itself known to conscious creatures. They invite those who think to believe and to affirm divine unity. Look upon the colored page of the book of the universe. See what forms the golden pen of power has traced. No dark point remains for the gaze of the heart's eye. It's as if God has inscribed his signs with light. Look what a miracle of wisdom is the amazing universe. Look what a wondrous spectacle is the vastness of space. Then listen to the stars, listen to their harmonious address. See what wisdom has emblazed on the degree of its light. Altogether they start to speak with the tone of truth. They address the majesty of the all-powerful, all-glorious ones, sovereignty. We are each of us light-scattering proofs of the excellence of our Maker. We are witnesses both to His unity and His power. We are subtle miracles gilding the face of the skies for the angels to gaze upon. We are the innumerable attentive eyes of the heavens, which watch the earth, which study paradise. We are the innumerable exquisite fruits, which the hand of wisdom of the all-glorious and beauteous one has fastened to the celestial portion of the tree of creation, to all the branches of the Milky Way. For the inhabitants of the heavens, we are each of us a traveling musk, a spinning house, a lofty hum. Each is an illumining lamp, a mighty ship, an aeroplane. We are each of us a miracle of power, a wonder of creative art. Created by the powerful one of perfection, the all-wise one of glory, a rarity of his wisdom, a marvel of his creation, a world of light. We demonstrated to mankind innumerable truths. We made them hear with these innumerable tones of ours. But their accursed, unseen, unbelieving eyes did not see our faces. They did not hear our words. And we are signs that speak the truth. Our stamp is one. Our seal is one. We are mastered by our sustainer. 
we glorify him through our subjugation, we recite his names, we are each of us in ecstasy, a member of the mighty circle of the Milky Way.